as I say, a lot of people talk about diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. uh, but very few go to the next level, set those goals, and then hold their managers accountable for delivering mm -hmm. on those goals. There should be a consequence for not diversifying your team. There should be a consequence for not diversifying your hiring panels. Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your guest host, Annie Wekeser, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Unifor. I'm so excited to be here today because we're having a different type of conversation around Women's History Month and around International Women's Day. Um, and the theme this year of International Women's Day is embracing equity. Today is a different type of episode and we're gonna talk about the importance of prioritizing diversity and inclusion in any business, especially during tough economic times. Recently, there was a CNBC article that really sparked a dialogue in the industry. It was about senior level leaders and women who are calling it quits after decades of climbing the career ladder. Everyone from Susan Wojcicki of uh, YouTube to executives at Meta to government leaders, um, the Scottish first prime minister, um, as well as the New Zealand prime minister. And this really points to a trend that shows that women leaders are leaving their organizations at the highest rate ever widening the gap between women and men in senior roles. And for some context, according to the joint Lean In and McKinsey um, Women in the Workplace report, for every woman stepping into a director leadership role, two are choosing to leave. So we're doing our part today to have the conversation and start the conversation and the dialogue. And before diving into our topics today, I want to introduce our first guest, Lisa Lambert, Lisa is the founder, CEO, and chairman of Upward. Upward is a global network of women executives, and it's a nonprofit organization with 16 chapters, 60 co corporate sponsors, and over 6,000 members worldwide. Lisa is also the founder and president of National Grid Partners, a Unifor investor. We are also fortunate to be joined by Umesh Sachdev, the CEO and co-founder of Unifor. And I wanna share my personal experience with Umesh. The first time I met Umesh, he's an executive that truly cares about a lot of the important issues that we're going to be speaking about today. So thank you, Lisa and Umesh for joining us and sharing your perspectives. Happy to be here, thank you. Thank you, Annie. We're looking forward to the conversation. So we'd like to have a little bit of fun at the beginning of these podcasts. And the way that we typically start is a round of rapid fire questions and I'll go easy on you guys. Um, but <clears throat> the way this works is I ask a question and you give either a one word or one phrase answer. Um, are you guys ready? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with you, Lisa. Would love to hear what's one word or phrase that you think about when you think about diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, what would you say? Maximum impacts. Maximum impact. That's a good one. How about you, Amesh? Um, if I think about a phrase, it's not a word. Um, I'm reminded of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's words where she said, um, real and enduring change happens one step at a time. Yeah. That's what I'm reminded of today. That's a really good one. And it's funny because I, I actually have her mug here because the other thing that she says is that women belong in all places where decisions are being made. So I really I really like that reference. Um, how about how about both of you have children, um, you know, sons or daughters? What advice would you give to your children as they first enter the workforce? Um, wh what do you hope for for them? I'll start. Uh, so I would tell my two boys that they should follow their passion. They should pursue their dreams. I think a lot of folks think you follow the money, but you really do follow your hearts. And my hope for them is that they have a fulfilling career that utilizes their skills that somehow impacts their communities and that they can enjoy the journey. I, I do think the money will follow if you're doing those things, but uh, those are the things that I would prioritize for them. I love that and enjoy the journey. Umesh, how about you for your son I mean, and my, my kids are 
really young right now. I have a nine-year-old daughter. My son is less than one. Um, so it's too early to think about advice for them. They have ways to go. What my wish would be for them is by the time they make career decisions entering the workforce, my wish would be uh, we're not having these kind of conversations at that point. My wish would be we're living in a world where there's the right balance of women and men leaders in all sorts of careers uh, and different positions. A couple of examples I can think of today, and we need way more, way more of that. Uh, Greta Thunberg, world-renowned environmental activist. Malala Yousafzai, Nobel Peace Prize laureate from Pakistan, uh, a very young, probably the youngest Peace Prize uh, uh, laureate out of the world, um, human rights activist, and Melanie Perkins in my industry, co-founder mm -hmm. and CEO of Canva. Okay. Um, so my wish is by the time my kids are ready to make career decisions and come to me for advice, that I don't have to talk to them about diversity, equity, and inclusion because, you know, the world is a very different place than what it is today. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, well, let's dive into the meat of the conversation um, now that we've, we're warmed up. Lisa, you've held a number of leadership roles and leadership positions over your career. And I would imagine that that journey or your experience really led you to the creation of Upward. Share with us a bit about that journey, navigating through corporate um, and, and how Upward really came to be. Yeah, they are connected for sure. So I started my career as a software developer and I progressed my way through a number of operating roles before going off to get my MBA from Harvard Business School. And upon getting that newly minted MBA, I decided to come out to California. It was the late 90s, and so the dot-com mania was at its, its peak. I joined uh, Intel. Uh, my background was in software, and so I thought I should join a silicon company to get more perspective on the hardware side of uh, the computing world. And I stayed there what I thought would be a few years, ended up being 19 years. Wow. And during that time, I formed Upward, and it was at a time in the kind of early teens, like 1913, 1914, excuse me, 2013, 2014 timeframe, where I was dealing with a difficult boss and had, you know, an increasingly political environment and in Intel, you know, less about the impact and your results, more about who likes you. And, you know, after some reflections, I thought, there are probably other women that are facing these challenges. And so I decided to invite a few of my senior level colleagues over for dinner and to have a conversation about it. You know, what, what their experiences were, how they're dealing with challenges and difficulties in the workplace, how are they managed to overcome those challenges and to still progress their career. And that was really the beginning in my backyard with what I thought would be 40 or 50 executive women turned out being 90 or so that showed up for that first event. Apparently a lot of women were facing these challenges and we had a great conversation about it. And it's ironically that it was around the time that Silicon Valley was in the spotlight for really poor diversity statistics mm. across all the major tech companies. And so it was top of mind. Uh, that was certainly what began the inspiration to form Upward. It was actually formed formally shortly after that. Wow, what a fantastic gathering. Like what a, what a great opportunity you gave them. Um, I can imagine that you had a front seat in terms of seeing where companies fail when it comes to diversity in the workplace. Elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, we've been doing Upwork for 10 years, actually celebrating our 10 year anniversary. Wow. And so we've talked to a lot of companies over the years. I, I think a, a lot of the reason for failure is uh, a, a lack of focus, a lack of commitment to change behaviors. Most people talk a lot about diversity inclusion and very few do something about it. And so I think my advice to anybody that's embarking on this journey, the first step is to understand why it's important. I think people intellectually think it makes sense to think about diversity, but I think practically they don't see the real benefits. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that, you know, we serve underserved communities, underrepresented markets. And oftentimes those people look like me and look like other diverse background people. I think the second step is to understand what your objectives are, to have a vision and have a set of goals, and then follow through on those goals. 
Um, you're not going to accomplish anything that you don't set a target to accomplish. I think the third step is having leaders who are accountable for delivering on those results. As I say, a lot of people talk about diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. uh, but very few go to the next level, set those goals, and then hold their managers accountable for delivering mm -hmm. on those goals. There should be a consequence for not diversifying your team. There should be a consequence for not diversifying your hiring panels. There should be a consequence for not um, you know, engaging uh, an audience of people that represent your customer base or that represent your stakeholder base. I mean, half the world's population are female and two thirds of American households are run by women. Mm -hmm. And we have large percentages of ethnic diverse people in the country as well and across the globe. And so there needs to be a consequence for not following through on the things that we set out as our goals. You hold managers accountable and you track their performance on it. You will see organizations respond. So I think that's probably the biggest failure, just a lack of commitment to really follow through yeah. to the end. That, that's great advice. Measure what matters and, and focus on the accountability. Um, you know, it's interesting, Umesh, I'd love to turn to you because it's a different economic environment, right? You're a business leader. You, you see an external macro that's really anything but stable. Um, and with a major shift on the way that that tech is operating, there's really a focus on results and accountability above all else. Um, so some people might ask, why, why in such a challenging climate are you choosing as a CEO to prioritize a diverse and inclusive workforce? Annie, that's a very relevant question. And as you rightly said, the economic climate that we live in is very dynamic to say the least. Um, interest rates are uh, at a point where they haven't been in the last three decades at least, still climbing, inflation is still not under control in many parts of the world. Um, and so why is diversity important today? First and foremost, it's the right thing to do, period. But let's be candid, you're right. When things are tough, when budgets are under, under stress, when profitability is in focus, uh, the easiest call that many business leaders and many businesses could make is to slash budgets, if they had any, uh, before this climate shifted, is to slash budgets for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging programs. But the reason companies should double down on these initiatives now more than ever is that it's, it's, it's better for business. Mm -hmm. And this has been shown time and again my own experience at Chinefor has, has taught me diverse teams prove to be more innovative. When you have similar people who think alike all in the, uh, in, on a team, it's very hard to get new ideas flowing. But diverse teams can disagree with each other, can debate with each other, and that is the fundamental ingredient needed for innovation to occur. And in difficult economic times, you need different ideas. If you keep doing more of the same, you're probably not going to get out of this uh, economic cycle as a winner. Yeah. The second thing that I've seen at Unifor and other places which have done this well is that diverse teams are more resilient. Studies have shown teams that have more diversity as a percentage uh, outperform teams that don't. Resiliency is what matters. The ability to, to take shocks, the ability to be agile in decision making, the ability to realize that the plans you might have laid out are no longer valid and we have to do something else. That needs resilience. And diverse teams prove to be, have proven to be more resilience, resilient than non-diverse teams. And finally, you know, Annie, you and I know this at Shunifor, uh, diverse leaders, especially women in leadership, are just, they have, you know, a better understanding of soft skills needed for business leadership, period. I'll give you a case study, an example. When COVID occurred, like many businesses and many CEOs, in the first few weeks of COVID, I wasn't sure where the world, world, world was headed. So we created a few different war rooms in the company. Those war rooms were designed to react fast to health emergencies, economic emergencies. We didn't know if our customers are gonna be fine or not, if our business was gonna be intact or not. And the few war rooms that did better than the others had women in their leadership position, and Annie, you led one of them. And I think it's very obvious to me why that occurred. Women just have a better emotional self-awareness, better ability to do conflict resolution, 
teamwork, empathy, et cetera. And amongst other things that business leaders require, these are very important skills that business leaders require. So diverse teams are more innovative, they're more resilient, and uh, women leaders just drive better results. We've seen that at Unifor. I'm sure other companies can testify to this, which is why when economically the times get tougher, this is the time to double down on these initiatives as opposed to saying, oh, you know, it's easy to cut budget here and focus on, on somewhere else. Thank you, Mesh. I, I think that was is really important. Um, and I know, Lisa, that, that allyship is such an important piece of what Umesh was talking about, right? Um, it, it's such an important piece of the equation. I found that personally. Um, and we, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, what is it that companies can do to foster these types of relationships? Yeah, I think the first is focus on it. You know, there's so many priorities. There's so many things under the DEIB uh, umbrella that you really get lost in all the different initiatives and all the different you know, programs to help support us achieving our objectives there. I think with allyship, it's a little different because it's something that we do in our day-to-day -day work, right? We're all good as professionals at building relationships, at forming allyships, and at supporting customers and other stakeholders in our communities. And so it seems intuitive, but what we find when we go into some of our clients' uh, companies is that senior leaders in particular are a little tentative about it. They're not exactly sure how to do it. So I think maybe hmm. in today's culture, we've got, you know, hashtag me too. We've got, you know, a lot of tension when it comes to male-female relationships. I think in particular in a professional context, they're a little gun shy. Hmm. They're a little more reserved uh, because the risk of failure is, is high in their view. So the first thing we do is we take an inventory of where they are culturally in terms of that male-female dynamic, it varies by company. You can imagine a law firm looks different than a tech startup, looks different than a regulated utility, right? In terms of how men and women inter interact and, and what the population, the demographics are at those firms. And so you want to take an inventory. And once you take that inventory, I think you put together some training mm. on how to do this right. Uh, we offer an, an allyship program, and we partner with a group called the Athena Group for a really yes. good a decade yeah. of experience. Yeah, you know yeah. them, uh, teaching professionals on how to be allies with their peers, with their employees, other stakeholders. And so they offer a bunch of techniques and a playbook on how to do this consistently across the various stakeholder groups. And so, you know, the next step is to ask people that you want to support uh, on their professional development, what they need from you, and then start practicing it, right? You get more skilled at the things you practice. And so I think if you take that kind of approach, you'll have uh, more meaningful results in the end. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, kind of building upon that, Umesh, talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion and what does that look like here at Unifor? So, Annie, my approach to Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at Unifor is one of, I don't think of it as a program. I think of it as something that's ingrained in our culture. And today our partnership with Upward is one small example of this. Mm -hmm. Much like, you know, businesses and fast growing software companies where we are very, very focused on driving results. We are also very focused on what we can do in terms of driving more diversity and inclusion. So in this phase of our growth, we're choosing to focus on gender diversity. And as, as the journey of Unifor goes along, we'll evolve this program and we'll evolve this mission. Uh, it's, you know, when we talk about our culture, there are many things that we write down on a piece of paper on what, what is Unifor culture, it's on our website. The very first one is that we say we are one big team. We take care of each other, we trust each other. We hold ourselves to high standards. We debate, but we never compete. And that bullet point ends by saying we are inclusive. Mm -hmm. And we underline that. So it's, it's truly a part of Unifor's culture. The way I think about it, it starts with leadership. If I have more, more diversity in my leadership, just subconscious bias will lead to more diversity as we recruit, as we build our teams. So we made a start. I've got two out of my 10 executive leaders being women. 
I've got two out of my 10 board members being women. We need to do much more here. Culture, like I said, we, we put it on paper, we remind each other that diversity and inclusive inclusion is a big part of our culture. And it's also about how we build our teams, recruit talent, et cetera. Today, we have a little over 800 people in the company, a global company, 30% of our workforce is women. Once again, it's a start. I'm proud of how we've started. We've got a lot more to be done, to be clear. But like I said, for me at Unifor, I don't think of this as a program. I think of this as how we, how we conduct our business in everything we do. Yeah. It's built into the foundation and the fabric. I agree. Um, Lisa, I'm, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. I'd love to know from a VC lens, um, what has your experience been when it comes to diversity, particularly when it comes to women run startups receiving funding? There's a lot of dialogue on this, uh, you know, on Twitter, if you're if you follow the VC community, but you have a front row seat. We'd love to hear your perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been in the venture capital industry for almost 25 years uh, at Intel Capital uh, and then at a private clean tech firm. Uh, and then, of course, now in my current role. So I, I have seen a lot. I even sat on the National Venture Capital Association Board of Directors for four years. And so we did surveys all the time on how venture capital firms and how startups are performing in this area. And despite the fact that it's been that long and you think there'd be more progress, there, there hasn't been a lot. There's been some progress. I think at the time that I was on the NVCA board, about 10% of the partners, general partners at VC firms were women, less than 1% ethnic minority. And around that time, about 8% of startups were founded by women, less than 1% ethnic minorities. And so, you know, those numbers are still pretty dismal and they may have improved a bit since I left the MVCA board, but they, they could have easily gone the other way. Um, it's just been very unpredictable these days. And so I think there's quite a lot more that we can do. Uh, I launched the Intel Capital Diversity Fund when I was at Intel, and it was a fund targeting women and minority-led startups. I did that, I think, around 2014. And one of the things I discovered as we kind of put the shingle on the door and said, we're open for business, one, we got a uh, an enormous number of business plans. And I think the myth mm. in the venture capital and startup world is that there just aren't that many women that are you know, leading startups and there are just not right. that many women that are interested in being venture capitalists, right? Well, as soon as we announced that we had a fund, it was a $125 million fund and we were gonna be investing in women and minorities, uh, we got 600 business plans right. in the first four months, 600 business plans in the first four months. And so that was phenomenal, and it just kind of dispelled that mess that, that women somehow weren't out there and they weren't interested in getting funding by VCs. Uh, but the other thing that we discovered is we started investing in these startups, these women-led startups, minority-led startups, is that the more diverse they were at the top, and this is something that we were required for them to get capital, they had to either be led and founded by a woman or a minority, or the 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 executive team needed to represent at least three women or minority on that, on that team. And what we found in every single company that we invested in was that when the top of the organization was diverse, you know, women or minorities, then the rest of the organization tended to be very diverse. I mean, by large numbers, like 60% or more mm -hmm. of the rest of the population were represented by the groups on that executive team. And so the notion that, one, that women aren't out there and they're not interested in, in being venture capitalists or startups is, is just a fallacy. Um, and two, the more diverse you are at the top, the more you're likely to recruit diverse people, mm -hmm. mostly because your networks tend to look like you. This mm -hmm. is something that we've learned over the last 10 years with Upward, that diverse teams have diverse networks and they recruit mm -hmm. out of those diverse networks. And so you end up getting an organization that reflects the diversity on the executive team if you make the effort to make the, uh, the executive team diverse. It really is pretty simple. I know it, there's a tendency to try to make it more complicated than it is, but it really is not that complicated. If you make a little bit of effort by having that diversity and then following through with goals and objectives and accountability, 
you will make your organization diverse virtually overnight. I've seen it with these startups and I know it's possible. So that's the encouraging part. Yeah. The numbers still don't really reflect what they should, but I think the possibility is enormous if you make the effort. Yeah, you heard it here first about the measurement and the focus and the accountability there. I, I love that. Um, and it's interesting because some of the acquisitions actually, in fact, that, that Unifor has made have been very diverse in terms of, you know, regionally as well as um, having women founders. But Umesh, talk a little bit about our growing global footprint um, and the impact on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging initiatives. And he spoke about this, the very first acquisition we did at Unifor was a company called Emotion Research Lab, headquartered in Valencia, Spain. And the CEO, Maria Pachovi, female founder, her co-founder, was also a, a, a woman leader in technology. Uh, every part of the world that we grew into, organically or inorganically, because it's such a big part of our culture, we do our, our best to promote diversity. And the reason we do it, like I said, is because we firmly believe diverse teams drive more innovation, and are more resilient, which ultimately leads to better business outcomes. I built Unifor over the last 15 years. The number of times I've been asked, uh, why haven't you given up? You must have faced tough times. How do you drive innovation over this long period of time? And it's about having very talented and diverse teams around yourself, surrounding yourself with people who can motivate and inspire you, even as a founder. And so my ask, my expectation, of all my leaders as we expand globally is, you know, as startups, it's our place to disrupt the status quo. And as Unifor, if you're not doing it, then we're not doing a good job. I'm gonna ask you guys one closing question before we drop today. And I'd love to know what's one thing that you personally are committing to this year that's gonna help support, promote, further this cause of embracing equity and empowering women in the workplace. Well, that's an easy one for me, right? We're, uh, we're in that world uh, at Upward, and we've got, as part of our celebration of International Women's Day, we've got a number of global virtual events that we're doing. We've got, you know, almost two dozen chapters where we're doing special events. Everybody on our board is going to strike the pose for uh, honoring uh, International Women's Day. And we're really just excited to celebrate the advancement of women, the potential for women to have an impact in the professional world and all of the opportunity that's in front of us. And so uh, we're excited about this month and we're looking forward to celebrating it with our, our members. Great. Well, I'll say, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be talking about this today with two partners. Uh, Lisa, you've been a great partner. We learn a lot from Upward and yourself and Annie. You've been my business partner in not just building Unifor, but driving the focus on diversity in this company for the past many years. So the one thing uh, I'm committing to is that this year more than ever, I'm gonna stay focused on driving the culture of diversity and inclusion at Unifor. We're navigating a dynamic economic time like any other business. So far we're doing a good job, but we're gonna stay focused no matter what happens on diversity. And that's a commitment I'm making. It's how we will hire. It's how we will talk about uh, issues in the company. And once again, I'm going to keep reminding my leadership team that we're going to make it a business priority. We're going to set goals for ourselves. Like Lisa, you reminded us, we're going to make them measurable so that we know that we're making progress. But more, more than anything else, we're going to stay curious and we'll keep disrupting the status quo. So that's my commitment, Annie. Thank you, Lisa Numesh, for joining us today and for sharing your perspectives. Thanks to also the people who are listening in and to join the movement and showcase how you are going to make an impact on this movement. Join the conversation, hashtag Embrace Equity. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit Unifor.com today.